This is the last in a series of videos about amortised cost. In the last three videos we've seen why amortisation is useful, because it's a handy way to find our group cost of sequences of operations, and we've defined what amortisation is. The goal of this video is to learn a practical way to actually find amortised costs. The method is based on what's called a potential function. Here's a definition and a theorem. Pause the video, have a read, copy this out, and then when you're ready, press play. First, a quick note about the definition. It says that phi of empty equals zero. Here, empty refers to the data structure's initial empty state. Second, this theorem has this funny notation S sub anti goes to S sub post with a superscript C. All I mean by this is, consider an operation on the data structure where the state beforehand was S anti and the state afterwards is S post and the cost, i.e. the running time of this operation, is C. Third, this equation, the equation that defines the amortized cost C prime, this is the shorthand way that we'll usually write it out, C prime equals C plus delta phi. This theorem gives us a simple crank the handle way to obtain amortized costs. We simply stick in the potential function and out prop the amortized costs. But this begs the question, how do we invent a potential function? What I hope you'll see from this video is that it's usually pretty intuitive to invent a sensible potential function, much easier than it would be to invent amortized costs from scratch. Let's work through an example. This is the dynamically sized array that we looked at in the last video. In that video, we calculated the amortized cost of appending an item, and we did it direct from the definition of amortized cost. Now, let's do the same thing, but this time we're going to use a potential function instead. Let's use this potential function here, phi equals kappa times twice the number of items stored in the array minus capacity. Let's see how this plays out. After the first item is appended, phi is kappa times two times one minus one, in other words, kappa. After another append, the new phi is equal to twice kappa. And so the amortized cost of this operation is C plus delta phi equals one plus two kappa. Pause the video, work out all the other potentials and amortized costs, and press play when you're ready to check your answers. You should have spotted a problem. The problem is the potential at the initial empty state, which according to this formula comes out as minus kappa. That's not allowed. The definition of potential function said it had to be above or equal to zero everywhere and equal to zero at the initial state. We can fix this by choosing a different potential function. This is how we should have defined it. Okay, so with that fix, this fills out the table of potentials and amortized costs. And it's also fairly easy to verify that this proposed phi is a valid potential function. I left in this little gotcha as a reminder that potential function is a term with a specific technical meaning. If, if you propose a phi that fails the definition, then it can lead you to invalid amortized costs. The example sheet will ask you to look at some of the things that go wrong when you use dodgy potential functions. Anyway, what you should have found when you work through all of these cases is that the amortized cost is equal to one plus two kappa for every single append here, apart from the first where it's equal to one plus kappa. So it seems the amortized cost is less than or equal to one plus two kappa for every single call to append. That is indeed true. Now let's write out a proper justification rather than just illustrations for small examples. Here's the way we'd typically write out an amortization analysis using a potential function. If you're looking closely, you'll notice I've changed the wording here slightly. In this version, it now says, suppose the cost of writing an item is big O of one and the cost of doubling from M to two M is big O of M. 
This is the way we usually write about algebraic complexity using big O notation. There's always a kappa hidden away, but in practice we never write it out. OK, well, let's go through the analysis. First thing I'd do is I'd sketch out the typical behaviour of the potential function just to orient myself. You should have seen when you work through the explicit calculations yourself that the potential function increases bit by bit until the array doubles, at which point it falls back down. So it does this sort of sawtooth. This, this bird's eye picture it makes it easy for us to set out what it is we actually have to calculate. There are two cases we have to think about. Either the append requires us to double, or it doesn't. If it does require doubling, this is what it looks like. We started off with m items in capacity m. We ended up with m plus 1 items in capacity 2m. So the old potential was m, the new potential is 2. Thus, the amortized cost, c plus delta phi, is the true cost, big O of m, plus delta phi, 2 minus m, which is big O of 1. In the other case, the case where we don't have to do any doubling, the amortized cost, c plus delta phi, is the true cost, big O of 1, plus the change in potential, which is pretty easy to work out, is 2, and this comes out again to be big O of 1. And one or other of these two cases applies to every single append operation we perform, apart from the very first, which we can write out for completeness. We've already worked this one out explicitly and come up with the answer, big O of 1. So, in every possible case, the amortized cost of appending an item is big O of 1, QED. Now, hold on, I hope you're thinking. The lecturer has gone mad, or sloppy, which is worse. If you're not thinking that already, pause the video and go through these steps and figure out what it is I've done here that's sloppy, and then press play. Here's the issue. How on earth can you subtract m from big O of m and end up with the answer big O of 1? What does this even mean? That is an excellent question to ask, and the way to answer it is to go back to definitions. Here is the rigorous interpretation of what we're told by the question. It tells us there's some n naught and some kappa greater than 0 such that if we've got an array of size m above or equal to n0, then the cost of writing in an item is less than or equal to kappa, and the cost of doing the double and copy across and writing in a new value, that is less than or equal to kappa times m. The information that we're given in the question, the big O complexities, they carry with them a constant kappa. Let's stick that kappa in as a multiplier in front of the potential function. Now we can write out the amortized costs properly and rigorously. The true cost is big O of m, i.e. the true cost is less than or equal to kappa times m, and the change in potential is delta phi equals kappa times 2 minus m. Now these two add together happily, and we're left with an answer that doesn't depend on m, and that's what we mean when we write that it's big O of 1. Likewise the next case. Technically, the third case is pointless. There's hardly any point even bothering to write out anything here except for these two cases cover every single append apart from the initial append. OK, so the conclusion we come to in the end that every single append is big of one is valid. You're totally welcome to use the sloppy notation, by the way. All this stuff about kappa and the precise definition of big O notation is only so that you feel justified in what would otherwise be a crazy thing to write out. OK, so we've done an analysis using a potential function which we were told. But what's really useful is to be able to come up with our own potential functions. And to help with that, I want to step back from all the calculations we've just been doing and think about what our potential function is actually doing. We have a data structure here which, from time to time, needs expensive housekeeping, namely doubling its capacity. The true cost of this housekeeping step is big O of m, and 
If we want to argue that the amortized cost is less than big O of m, we need to have a potential function that will drop by m. You can think of the potential function like a bank account. We're depositing money into it day by day in anticipation that we're going to need to pay out a large bill. Or alternatively, you could think of it as a measure of the messiness or tension in our data structure. Most of the operations store up work for us, work that we'll have to do at some point in the future, in this case the work of doubling and copying. Okay, with these interpretations in mind, let's go back to a problem we looked at several videos earlier, the min list. If you don't remember this example, go back to the video about aggregate analysis for a refresh. The idea is we want a data structure which will store a list of items and we may from time to time ask for the minimum and we want an implementation that's more efficient than just trawling through the entire list every time we're trying to find the minimum. We looked at this implementation called stage one where we cache the minimum so that next time we're asked for it we only have to look at newer items. Now a question, how could we use the potential method to prove that append and min both have amortized cost big O of 1. Pause the video, work out your answer, press play when you're ready. Here's the obvious choice. We'll let phi be the number of items at the tail of the list that haven't yet been processed by min. This fits in with our idea of phi as measuring messiness. There's a bunch of work that we're storing up for ourselves, namely the work of comparing each item that we've appended, so we'd better put some money in the bank to pay for that work when the bill comes due. Just a quick aside, don't think of what we're trying to do here as trying to derive the correct potential function. There's no such thing. It's up to us. We're free to choose whatever potential function we want and different potential functions will lead to different amortized costs. At the end of the day, all that matters is whether the amortized costs we've found are useful. In other words, do they give tight bounds on aggregate costs? If the amortized costs that you've found don't lead to tight bounds on aggregate costs, maybe that's a hint that you need to go back and redesign your potential function. Well, okay, let's look at the amortized costs that we get from this potential. The amortized cost of append is true cost plus delta phi, which is big O of 1 plus 1, in other words, big O of 1. And the amortized cost of the min function is true cost big O of L, where L is the number of items in the tail that we're going to process, plus delta phi, which is minus L. So the total amortized cost, again, is big O of 1. Okay, well, this is a typical piece of amortized analysis. I hope you'll agree that despite all the formal definitions, all the convoluted setup, it all turns out very simple and intuitive at the end. There are plenty more examples of this sort of analysis on the example sheet. And in the next video, we're going to look at a very sophisticated data structure with a very elegant use of potential function for calculating its amortized costs. But before going on to that, I just want to wrap up with a remark about potential functions. We started this video with a theorem, the potential theorem, that says if we define modified costs using a potential function, then we end up with valid amortized costs. I don't want to go through the proof in this video. It's an easy proof, but it's based on algebra rather than on big ideas, so there's nothing to be gained by talking through it. Instead, please go to the printed notes and read it and copy it out and remember it, it is examinable.